We've finished one-dimensional forces, and now we're going to move on to two-dimensional forces. So with two-dimensional forces, we are going to have forces pulling at an angle. So for example, we have a 10 kilogram block, and I'm going to apply a force diagonally upward, and let's say that that angle is going to be 30 degrees from the horizontal. So we can calculate all the same stuff just with our forces at an angle. So we still have the weight pointing down and the normal force pointing up, but since we have a force with a component in the y direction, we don't actually know what the normal force is. It's not going to be the same as the weight if there's another force acting on it. So what we do next is we break up the force at an angle into components, just like we broke up uh, velocity vectors when we were doing that stuff. So in the x direction, it's my adjacent side, so it's going to be equal to 100 cosine 30. And in the y direction, that force is going to be equal to 100 sine 30. So what is this block going to do? That picture is a little messy. Let's redraw it so that all our forces are either parallel or perpendicular to our axes. So the x component was 100 cosine 30 the y component was 100 sine 30. So we like this picture better. Everything is parallel or perpendicular to our axis. And let's say we want to find the normal force first. So in the y direction, this block isn't going to fall or uh, jump up off the table. So its acceleration is zero in the y direction. So the sum of our forces in our y is equal to our mass times the acceleration in the y. So the normal force acting up plus the y component of the force acting up minus the weight because it's opposite the other two forces, all of that is going to equal zero. So we are looking for our normal force. So it's 100 minus 50. 100 sine 30 is 50 because sine 30 is 1 half. So our normal force is 50 newtons. So notice that that's less than our weight. The normal force doesn't have to push back as hard because we're supporting some of the weight with the force. Good. So now we can look at what's going on in the x direction. Let's look for the x acceleration. Looking at our second drawing, we only have one force acting in the x direction, so it's pretty easy. Uh, our x force is 100 cosine 30, and that's going to be equal to 10 kilograms times our acceleration. So 86.6 newtons divided by 10 kilograms. Our acceleration is going to be 8.66 meters per second. Nice. Let's spice it up a little. Let's say that it's on a rough surface and that there's friction. So let's find the acceleration if we consider friction. So let's say that static friction, the coefficient is going to be 0.5, and kinetic friction, it's going to be 0.25. Redrawing our picture, everything stays the same. We found a normal force already, so we can plug that in. And in addition to all of our forces, we're going to have a frictional force pointing the other way. So first, we have to check and see if we can overcome static friction. So for static friction, it's equal to mu s times the normal force. Plugging in our numbers, uh, half of our normal force is just 25 newtons. So our applied x force is 86.6, and that is greater than our 25 newtons. So we know that it's going to move and that it's governed by kinetic friction. So plugging in our equation for kinetic friction, it's equal to the kinetic coefficient times the normal force. So 1 quarter of 50 is 12.5 newtons. Okay, so now that we've found the magnitude of our frictional force, we can use Newton's second law to find acceleration. So the sum of my forces in my x is equal to my mass times my acceleration in my x. 
So we're going to have a positive 86.6 minus 12.5 is equal to 10 kilograms times our acceleration. Do that math. Divide both sides by 10. We get acceleration is 7.41 meters per second squared. So it's a little less than without friction, which makes sense. So what if we took the same picture and instead of pulling upward we scratch that pull downward and let's say that we're 30 degrees below the horizontal this time we would go about it exactly the same way so we have our x component which is exactly the same as it was before, but this time our y component is 100 times sine 30 in the downward direction. Redrawing that free body diagram, we have the 86.6 pointing to the right, the normal force, the 100 newtons, but instead of another upward force, we have a downward force pulling at 50 newtons. So, to find our normal force, we know that, once again, it's not going to jump off the table or fall through the table, so the y acceleration is going to be zero. So it's going to be our normal force minus the weight minus the force that we are pulling with. So solving for Fn, it's 150 newtons. So our old one, when we were pulling up, was only 50 newtons. So because we're pulling down, we have to increase the normal force. It's kind of like um, when we talked about pushing down on a block would increase the normal force. Good. So let's find our acceleration if there's friction. So the same conditions as before. The static friction coefficient is going to be 0.5. The kinetic friction coefficient is going to be 0.25. So the max static friction this time is going to be 0.5 times 150. So we get 75 newtons. So let's see. We pulled with 86.6, and the max static friction is going to be 75. So we got closer to overcoming to not overcoming static friction, but we're still going to win. It's, it's just a little closer now. So, we know that it's going to move, which means we have to worry about kinetic friction. Let's redraw our diagram with friction included. Good. So, our kinetic friction is equal to mu kinetic times the normal force. The normal force for this one is going to be 150. So, 0.25 times 150, that is equal to 37.5 Newtons. So we know the magnitude of our two horizontal forces. We can do Newton's second law. 86.6 minus 37.5 is equal to 10 kilograms times the acceleration. Solving for A, we divide both sides by 10. We get acceleration is 4.91 meters per second. That's significantly less than what we found before. And that makes sense. Since we increased our normal force, we also increased our friction. So this is one type of problem in two dimensions. The other one we're going to talk about today, uh, they're called static problems. So static, it means it's not moving. So if it's not moving, that means the acceleration is equal to zero. So. Static problems usually go something along the lines of you have a block suspended from the ceiling by two or more cables. In this example, it's suspended by two cables. One is at 60 degrees and one is at 30 degrees. So let's draw the forces on the block. We have its weight, as always. So that's going to be 100 newtons. Tension 1 on the left and tension 2 on the right. So both of these forces are at diagonals. 
The first thing we have to do is break them down into their x and y components. So there's a y, there's an x. Now the question is, which angle is 60 degrees? You might have to brush up on similar triangles. So the angle that is 60 degrees is boop, that one in the top left. So my green rise is equal to T1 sine 60, and my yellow one is equal to T1 cosine 60. We're going to do the same thing for T2. So this one is going to be some parallel line theorem. So the angle in question is going to be that one on the bottom, and that's 30 degrees. So my yellow one is a cosine 30, my green one is opposite, so it's sine 30. So this picture is really busy. We're going to redraw it so that we only have our parallel and perpendicular forces. So we have from T1, T1 sine 60 going up, T2 sine 30 going up, T2 cosine 30 going right, and T1 uh, cosine 60 going left. Whew. A lot of forces. So all of our forces are either parallel or perpendicular, so we are ready to solve an equation. Let's just start with y. That one's going to be the more complicated side since it also has the weight. There's three forces involved there. So we know that this is zero, so it doesn't really matter which ones you put as positive. I like putting my upward forces as positive and my downward ones as negative. So T1 sine 60 plus T2 sine 30, because they're in the same direction, minus the weight, which is pulling down. That's all equal to 100 newtons. So the problem that we run into is we have two unknowns and only one equation. So like we did with projectiles, what we don't know, we have to look at the other dimension to find. So we have to look at the stuff in the x. So same as before, the sum of the forces in the x direction is going to equal zero, because it's not moving in the x direction. So first, I have uh, T2 cosine 30 pulling to the right, minus T1 cosine 60 pulling to the left. That's equal to zero newtons. So I still have two unknowns here. I'm going to solve for T2 in terms of T1. So I get that T2 is equal to T1 cosine 60 divided by cosine 30. With this, I can plug it into my y equation, and this is where things get ugly, but bear with me. T1 sine 60 plus T1 cosine 60 over cosine 30, that was our answer from the other one, times sine 30, don't forget the sine 30, is equal to 100 newtons. Ugh. Start plugging stuff into the calculator. T1 times 0.866 plus T1 times 0.577 times 0.5. I can factor out a T1. And so dividing 100 newtons divided by 0.866 plus 0.289, I will get 86.6 .6 newtons. So the tension in my left string is 86.6 .6 newtons. Finding the remaining tension isn't so bad. I'm just going to take this and plug it in to that equation for T2. So T2 is equal to 86.6 .6 times 0.577. That's cosine 60 over cosine 30. I went ahead and plugged that into my calculator. And crunching the numbers, I get 50. A nice, remarkably clean 50. So my first tension was 86.6. .6. My second tension is 50 newtons. Those are kind of ugly problems. They're really algebra heavy. And if you know your trig identities, it helps a little bit sometimes. Um, I'll probably post another video on static problems later this weekend. because they are hard to get the first go-round.